Hello again, and welcome back. I am Jared Case, Curator of Film Exhibitions at the Dryden Theater and the George Eastman Museum with another recommendation for you, finding great moving image stuff out there on the web while we're still at home. And I've got a special guest, another special guest, another graduate of the L. Jeffrey Southland School of Film Preservation from the year 2007. Please welcome Antonella Bonfanti. Hi, thanks for having me, Jared. So I was so honored by the invitation. <laughs> Oh, come on. You knew it was going to get around to you eventually. <laughs> <laughs> so you're out in California now, despite uh, being born north of the 49th. Uh, and you are at Berkeley. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, your position there and what you're doing? Sure. Yeah, I just I started as the film collection supervisor at the UC Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive, which I think to our community is um, the the, the layman term would be the PFA. <laughs> um, and in my role there, I oversee our collection of about 16,000 film and video. Um, we have a, I have a very privilege to work with a team of four people. Our amazing archivist, John Shibata, who has been stewarding that collection for, I, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna say 25 years, but don't hold me to that. Um, and two wonderful projectionists who also sort of double as our processing technicians, which is really, really interesting. And um, these are Doug Catellus and Gibbs Chapman. So really, I've got a really stellar team that I get to work with. And I've been relying on them heavily since I started my job during the pandemic and haven't really <laughs> had an opportunity to work with the collection <laughs> in the way that I expected to when I accepted the offer in February. <laughs> Like almost a year ago now. So um, yeah, it's been a really wonderful experience. I'm already, you know, working remotely as best as we can. And the, my team is able to get on site to do scanning and um, kind of move some preservation projects forward. But mainly, you know, my job is um, to oversee our, our, our work and to, over, and to kind of set priorities for preservation, um, digitization, and work with our curators and our film library team to kind of come up with um, coordinated and collaborative projects that we can kind of highlight as um, to our, our constituency in Berkeley and now in this amazing virtual world and beyond, hopefully. <laughs> so that sounds what, like a, a part-time job, just, you know, get throw a couple hours at it every once in a while. Yeah, yeah, basically. Yeah, no, I'm there all the time. I mean, I'm at my, I have my desk, I'm here, right here all the time. Um, but yeah, it's a full time, you know, full time position. I feel so privileged that I, you know, when I started at the Selznick School and kind of started to understand what kinds of opportunities there were, employment opportunities there were out in the film, in the, outside in the, you know, film archiving, uh, world of uh, uh, working at with a collection like the one at the Pacific Film Archive was, you know, a dream come tr was a dream then, and it's a dream that's come true. And I'm really excited, even though it's been a a slow start to really hit the ground running. Once I'm allowed to go do my job. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm doing work. I do plenty of work working on, um, you know, grant proposals and again, kind of just the general day to day of administering, being an administrator within a museum. Um, yeah, anyway, I'm rambling. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about the collection at the PFA? Sure. It's a, it's a, it's a, it has, it's a pretty vast collection and in many ways, encyclopedics, not quite. Right, but it has several areas of focus, namely um, uh, Japanese cinema. It has a very robust collection of Japanese cinema. Um, it also has a, a very robust collection in American avant-garde with a focus on um, the West Coast and, and um, the Bay Area, which is a, was, was a, starting in the well starting really with the in the 50s but really kind of skyrocketing in the 60s a really a really rich history of avant-garde experimental and underground filmmaking um, with cinematechs and makers and plenty and lots of schools and this is sort of really robust network of talented people that kind of all coalesced around the PFA once it opened in the 70s. Another area of, um, of focus in our collection are these really extraordinary collections of uh, artist made video or um, guerrilla television and sort of artist produced uh, 
news. Uh, so independently produced news by artists would be another way of putting it. And we have the collection of the TV TV um, group who uh, went out and documented the the well, they have they have several areas of focus, but they created these documentaries that aired on public television. Um, and I'm getting the details a little, I'm muddying up the details a little bit here, but we have a wonderful website, which I'll share the link with you, Jared, and maybe you can put it in the, in the, in the notes for this, in the, in the YouTube notes for, for our talk. Um, There's definitely going to have to be a link for the, uh, the website that we're going to be talking about too. So I can include that as well. Okay, great. Yeah. So TV, TV, and it's uh, what we, what the, we received the, BAM PFA received a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities to digitize all of the outtakes for uh, Gerald Ford's America um, uh, four more years, which was, and then there was also the world's greatest, the world's largest, sorry, I wasn't preparing for this part. <laughs> that's all, it's all, it's all mundling it all up. But anyways, all of this information is, is all of the, 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 the raw footage is available through our TV TV portal. There are wonderful um, new essays available that have been ready, written by um, talented scholars and professionals such as uh, Rick Prelinger and, um, and Brian Fry, as well as interviews between former cur video curator for PFA, Steve Side, and many of the TV TV founders. Um, so it's a really robust site. There's plenty to, to explore. It's a this wonderful kind of glimpse behind the curtain into this kind of cutting edge of television at, um, a, at a moment where technology was making that possible with the invention of quarter packs and all that kind of stuff. It's a really, it's a wonderful resource. It's an interesting project. Go check it out. <laughs> It's really the avant-garde that I was hoping you would bring up to not only uh, connect your past, but also the future of what we're going to be talking about today, because you came to the PFA from Canyon Cinema. Yeah, that's right. I was the director and prior to that collection manager at Canyon Cinema for a period of about seven years. Um, and I, I developed a profound passion and love for experimental filmmaking in, in while well, I was an undergraduate at the University of Toronto and then became a projectionist shortly thereafter and often worked for many of the small independent uh, film festivals as well as worked for the university um, projecting films for their classes where I kind of got a um, an opportunity to really understand film as a material object, um, which was something that I hadn't really, aside from, you know, my family's home movies, hadn't really had an opportunity to do up until that point. So uh, one other area of focus I've always had throughout this kind of, throughout my, my desire to be a movie and image archivist is to work with experimental and avant-garde collections. And so you know, getting to work at Canyon was an extraordinary privilege because as a distributor of experimental film, you know, we're mainly working with, as, and then one of the rare distributors that still distributes 16 millimeter film prints primarily. Um, so an opportunity to really participate in uh, providing access to these works of art, uh, but also the opportunity to work directly with artists um, was really amazing. Um, Canyon as a collection, I mean, now it's upwards of, it must be coming up on 300 artists. Um, when I started, we had about 265. Um, and so um, that's a lot of people who have, who are very passionate about their artwork and the artworks of their colleagues and their, um, and their contemporaries. And so, yeah, it's a really wonderful, people are very earnest and excited to have their works out into the world. Everyone has different ways of how they think that should be done and I enjoyed hearing all of it and trying to enact as much of it as we could so yeah and that hopefully leads us into the exhibit that's going up at the PFA now uh, if we did get this done right and post it on Friday the 5th it's actually going to be starting on March 5th so why don't you tell us a little bit about that yeah so um really exciting uh uh, my colleague Kathy Garretts um, has curated a program called Sarah Catherine Arledge's Film and Art, um, which is being launched um, on March 12th, as you said, and will run until March 21st and, co and coincides with um, 
a book launch by Irene Satsos called um, for the one of the first books ever to be written about this criminally underknown um, artist Sarah Catherine Arledge and the book is called Serene, um, Serene for the Moment uh, Sarah Catherine Arledge which is the catalog for um, what has to be one of the probably I mean I would assume one of the only uh, solo art exhibitions that have been dedicated to Sarah to Arledge's work which took place at the at the Armory Museum in Pasadena um, their website is actually still up and you can it actually has wonderful kind of comprehensive or it offers a very good snapshot of um, Arledge's uh, concerns as an artist, as a painter, as a filmmaker, um, and uh, and also just sort of as a thinker, like her as a as a human and as a as a person. I discovered Arledge at Canyon Cinema. Um, you know, I had a I mean, I was you know, privileged to have a pretty robust knowledge of experimental film, but coming from the East Coast, um, it's the what you learn in school or what you get to see in in the cinemas is kind of has a more regional concern. So moving out to California, I suddenly became introduced to, uh, a, you know, an entirely new canon of, of filmmakers and many of and, and many of whom um, are super important. I didn't even know who they were. I was like, how did I not know who Chick Strand was? What's wrong with you people who taught me things? <laughs> what was wrong with me for not realizing who this person was? Anyway, um, but in an attempt to, you know, part of my mandate at Canyon, along with those of my colleagues, um, my predecessor as director, uh, Dina Johnston, and my colleague for many years, Seth Mitter, was to, oh, and of course the board and, you know, every, all the volunteers and everyone was really, there's a sort of this movement towards um, reimagining the experimental film canon. So like who's important, who was doing interesting things beyond Stan Brackage or Michael Snow or, um, you know, the, 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 the more well-known names. And so whenever we, we were in a position where we might've been uh, curating programs or if we ever had uh, scholars coming through who may be interested in, a, in discovering something, we would often just you know, sh show things that we're discovering, we're pick things to watch that were discoveries for ourselves as well. And so Arledge for me was one of these, was one of these, uh, was one of these artists. And in particular, um, there's two films which are part of the program. One is called Introspection and the other one is called What is a Man? And Introspection was made between 41 and 47. And so ooh, it's, a, it's a dance, to oversimplify it, it's a, it's a dance right. film. Um, but it's also a very early example of color experimental film. Mm -hmm. So I don't, you know, if you, if you, and for, okay, let me back up for a second. What I got really excited about, and I, I actually haven't had the opportunity to actually interact with the, the original elements, which are at BAM PFA, I really suspect that this is a, one of the earliest examples of an artist using revert color reversal film as a way to express their vision for something. And so I think in our in our in the, the sort of documentation we have about Arledge's um, biography, she was um, you know an art professional. She was trained in education and she was really interesting. I think what really fascinated her about um, film was that it allowed for painting to come into motion and and so you really start to see the beginning of that with a film like introspection which um is really sophisticated it's a very sophisticated production utilizing a lot of different color lights and costumes um, but it also utilizes a lot of really interesting superimposition techniques and and distorting lenses and um all of this to kind of give you a sense of a you know, to give you a, a, a sensory experience while watching the film that's both visual but also kind of invoking of an inner of like an inner world so um, it's, a, it's a really it's a and for its time it just it, for me it's remains one of the sort of great unknown works of the American experimental film canon so. 
And what what you're offering online are three of her films that she made as a filmmaker, but then also some additional video elements, including uh, a video that is a, sort of a, a gallery of her glass slides. Yes. So she a really innovative artist working across media. Um, and yes, yeah, she in the 19, she spent a brief period of she, you know, spent most of her life either in Pasadena or Santa Cruz, California. But she one of her earliest uh, champions was Frank Stoffaker, who started one of who started a film had a film program at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art um, called Art in Cinema. Mm -hmm. And he showed introspection there and she was so she was sort of amazed that there was community of <laughs> that there was a community of people interested in experimental film. And so she moved here, <laughs> which is true for so many, <laughs> so many artists, so many experimental filmmakers. It's like, oh, people know about this stuff. I'm moving to San Francisco. Sweet. Anyway, but while she was up here, she was working at the what became the California College of Art um, in Oakland with its main campus in Oakland. And um, she was working on glass slide transparencies. And so she took the gels that she used to make um, introspection and, um, you know, the, the sort of larger glass slides, like something that you would use in a magic lantern. And um, and she, you know, experiment with it. She did. She basically made collage and uh, and multimedia, mixed media art on these slides, which were then meant to be projected at in the cinema at massively large scale. <laughs> and so, um, in this program that's dedicated to her, there are sort of two examples of her slides. So she did these in the, in this period of the 1940s and 50s, and then she would would. would it, in the period in between then and the 1970s, she would she returned to slide making and actually um, Interior Garden Two is is similarly uh, it's a it's a finished film, but it is a film of her slides, um, which was a way for her to address the um, not having to be present to screen them <laughs> to have them shown. <laughs> And also sort of address this sort of her the script at which she wanted film, but she wanted the slide like the pace at which she wanted the slides projected and then also gave her an opportunity to add some sound and then kind of other flourishes and whatnot that that kind of that helped her convey her allowed her to be not present in order to, for uh, an audience to experience the the work. <laughs> the the slides I found were almost but specifically, I guess, what is a man has sort of a, a beginning, middle, and end, and that you're following some people. But the the slides themselves almost seem to be more narrative, and that most of them were figural in one way or another. They're either featuring uh, an animal or a person, or having shapes that uh, suggested uh, either a group of people or or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think the work is really, it's, it's definitely abstract. Um, but it, but you're right, it does, there are these sort of moments of, of there are these, there are these um, nods to the natural world and these kinds of, and these, and these um, expressions of, of the interaction of nature and um, abstraction. And um, they're really, they're really beautiful. Um, yeah, yeah they're, they're extraordinary to look at. And I'm, I'm glad that there's uh, a representation of them up there. They is this also? It's it's just a virtual exhibition, right? It is just a virtual exhibition. Originally, it had been intended to be um, in our in our cinema. Um, it's part of our Out of the Vault series, which is a National Endowment for the Arts supported uh, program where our where we highlight important parts of our collection. And so um, we at Ban PFA actually are the we are the custodians and the rights holders for um, mm -hmm. Sarah Kathleen Arledge's work through the um, and for it's a very you know prized portion of our collection and especially now you know we 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 have the films and the slides and her and her papers and actually really very recently received a grant to digitize her papers through a wonderful project called California Revealed. Um, and so that's exciting because those will then all be available for research online. Um, and then also that there's there has been we don't currently hold her paintings, or if we do, we hold a few that are uh, on the, the art collection and the film collection are managed separately. Um, but 
this most recent exhibition at the Armory really highlighted how talented she was as a as a as a painter as well. And so, um, yeah, I hope that it just in, uh, programs like this, Irene's book, it will really kind of elevate her into people's consciousnesses and, and, and hopefully folks will be more interested in discovering her films or artwork. And this virtual exhibition, this, the film specifically, cover nearly a 40 year period from, we've got the one from the 40s, one from the late 50s, and one from the late 70s. And typical of an independent artist like this, she was sort of repurposing some of the images. I noticed some of the uh, figures, dancing figures from her first film were showed up in What is a Man? And as you say, some of those slides showed up in Interior Garden as well. Yeah, def I think she was really, I got the sense that she was pretty frugal, that she was like <laughs> repurposing things. And I was looking through our, our catalog and it looks like we actually have a, we, there's a, a portion of her, of her materials, which are all camera, we work, you know, it's like 54 camera rolls. And um, I'm excited to delve into that, to discover what <laughs> might be in there or how those camera rolls might relate to the finished films if they do or if they don't. So yeah, I believe she did repurpose you know, I, I can't speak to her intentions specifically because I don't know, but I get the sense that part of it was being frugal and part of it was just her, the, the, the she had, there were reoccurring themes that were, and, and concepts and ideas and issues that were important to her that kind of allowed for her to kind of re, to revisit those, some of those um, visual elements. So um, she had a really um, difficult and, traumatic life um, and as part of the presentation there is a kind of a recorded biographical um, lecture from this gentleman Terry Cannon um, that kind of goes into a little bit of the, the, the details of her personal life but she um, was institutionalized many times um, and was uh, had a period of, of schizophrenia she was, she was there were moments where I, where she sought help and then moments when her her husband had her institutionalized against her will um, and you know and she and she you know had these you know, a lot, I think her artistic practice was interrupted many times over the years because of these, because of these, you know, the, the issues surrounding her personal life. I think that's why you, we have these major gaps in her filmmaking specifically. I'm not an expert in her paintings or her, her, in her yeah, in her painting or her drawing work, but I get the sense that there's more of a continuity there. Of course, it's a lot easier to, to a lot simpler to do a watercolor. Right. That doesn't need to be sent to the lab or edited or printed or <laughs> so this is simplicity to other kinds of art practice that film does not afford you. <laughs> so um, so I often I've been thinking kind of anecdotally about like, well, what is it if you are a, a practicing artist and you want your work recognized, if you lit, are in a supportive relationship and you have some financial stability, then you have an opportunity to really get yourself out there and go on on tours and pick up the phone and call that gallerist or you know the kinds of self promotion that um, is a part is aside from your talent as an artist is a part of right. what makes you <laughs> discovered and known and, and known as an artist and if you don't have that that, that you know if you don't have someone really going to bat for you or you're not able to to really represent yourself then you know, what happens to your work. And, yeah, and so luckily this, like Terry Cannon and his wife, Mary, um, they befriended Arledge in the 1970s and um, they, they became kind of trusted allies for her and kind of stayed in touch through the 90s, through the period of her death and leading up to her death, they, they established a trust for her work so that there would be kind of a formal entity for the preservation of it. And um, they arranged for the films and the, the films, the slides and the papers to come to, to mm -hmm. the Vampire Fay, which is really, which is really lucky. We're so privileged to get to have these films and, and make them available for rediscovery. So <laughs> and now she's being recognized with her own virtual exhibit on the BAM PFA website. Can you tell the audience uh, how to access that? 
Yes, there is. Um, you can access the site. You can access the program through our website um, called BAMPFA at BAMPFA.org. Um, <laughs> and then um, the the platform that we are using is called Eventive. And there is actually really wonderful tutorials that my colleague Dave Taylor made um, that explains how you can, if you're not tech savvy enough to figure it out on your own, you can watch one of the tutorials that will um, explain how you log in and then how you can connect. If you like to watch, not watch everything on your computer screen and maybe you wanna like project it or depend, put it on your big flat screen TV, there are ways for you, there's tutorials to instruct you on how to connect through your Roku or your Apple TV or HDMI or however other way. <laughs> It's only up for two weeks, though, so yeah. people have to rush there. Uh, and the tickets, uh, how much are they? I believe they're twelve dollars. Okay. Yeah, twelve dollars. And so, um, and I'd say that you know, if you are, if you're someone who doesn't know much about experimental film, and this is uh, maybe a, an opportunity to open the door, I just want to say that this is a, the, the films are very short, right. and so you can. They're like bite-sized and you can kind of give it a try and take a look and digest them in your, you know, as, as you, as you can. Um, but I, you know, I strongly recommend, you know, give it, taking, giving to be bold and adventurous and giving these films a try. Um, and also I just want to give, to particularly say that what is a man is so different from all of the other films. But um, for those of you who know about like found footage films, um, right. you'll see that this is not a found footage film in any way, but it really it recreates this aesthetic of educational films or what you yeah. would eventually come to expect of a found footage film in a way that's like totally unprecedented, unprecedented super innovative and really interesting. And the movie's funny. Yeah. <laughs> Believe it or not. <laughs> so anyway, that's my... That's my <laughs> that's my uh, endorsement for Sarah Kathleen Arledge and this extraordinary program. And you know, BAMPFA has plenty of as a really robust uh, streaming streaming offerings. So I you know, mm -hmm. I, you know if you're like get attract enticed by something else, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I will have links to those down in the notes for this video as well, so you can go directly there instead of having to try to find it on the web. Um, I wanted to thank you, Antonella, for bringing this to our attention and uh, sitting down and spending some time with us. But before you go, I do have this little five question survey that I've been doing with good news coming, hopefully, with uh, reopening uh, theaters. Uh, I'm hoping to get a sense of people's cinematic uh, particulars, if that's OK with you. Uh -huh. Sure. All right. So the first question is, what is your first cinematic memory? Ooh, first cinematic memory. Um, my first cinematic memory is of, well, these are conflicting. I'm, I believe <laughs> that, I think this is my first cinematic memory, is going to see one of the uh, Care Bear movies <laughs> at the, you know, at the, at the, at the mall with my mom and being totally terrified of, like the Care Bear is falling off a cliff. I don't even know that 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 there's like a scene of of, of Care Bears <laughs> like, but that's my earliest sort of big room, big dark room, bright screen Care Bears. Um, but my more sort of like concrete is uh, going to see twins, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the cousins, and after eating pizza. So. That's, <laughs> um. What was there a, a cinema when you were growing up? Some place that you went to on a regular basis? You have fond memories of? Yes, and I'm embarrassed to say that I can't remember the name of it, but it was like our neighborhood multiplex that was uh -huh. just like ten minutes away. My parents like to go to the movies, and so it was great. And they weren't um, uh, particularly restrictive about what I could see either. So, you know, as long as there was no, it wasn't like too many sex scenes or <laughs> i mean they didn't ever seem to really worry about violence too strong I mean, so basically as long as it was like pg-13 uh -huh. they would take, they would take me so <laughs> um so it was really great i got to see a lot of i think a lot of films that were maybe adult beyond my beyond mm -hmm. my years um 
which I didn't totally understand at the time. <laughs> but that's fine. <laughs> So what is your favorite sensory experience about going to the theater? Mm. Mm. That's a good question. I think I, you know, I get excited about the, at least when I'm going to see film projected, like, so mm -hmm. um, the sounds of the booth, if, if I can yeah. hear them. Those are, those are always, those will forever quicken my heart. Yeah, the, you are the first one to say that and that would have been my answer immediately. <laughs> run. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we had the, I, over the years, you know, I started my career as a projectionist and had these like really high standards of like what good projection was and, you know, consist, you know, all, you know, all of the stuff. But over the years, as it became clear to me that it was harder and harder to, to ha have those expectations. Um, and that in the end, for me, what became most important was, you know, of course that, you know, that was that the opportunity to just see film projected. And so there's obviously certain levels of like, you know, you don't want the print needs to be not destroyed, you know, like protect, like making sure that the print is safe, but that if you're in a space where you're only, op like if your only option is to put a 16 projector at the back of the room and, Mm -hmm. and all you and you're and you're using the like internal speaker and that's all you're that's all you can do <laughs> and that's good enough it's like <laughs> is it in focus is it in frame great good enough <laughs> um but obviously i you know still main, i'm always strive towards the highest standards but will accept a bright in focus in frame <laughs> image <laughs> over the perfect cinema environment where do you sit when you go to the cinema? Oh, I, I move all over the place. I'm a definitely middle of back mm -hmm. center person. And one more that's not as experiential. You've got tons of them behind you, so you can just reach back and grab one. Can you recommend a book while people are at home, something that they can grab and uh, read up about either experimental cinema or California cooperatives or, oh, look at that. <laughs> Radical Light. This book is amazing. <laughs> and it's a testament to the like, in, it's a testament to the brilliance of some of my colleagues, Kathy Garretts and Steve Side, but also Steve Anker, who's not a, um, uh, we're not, you know, we're not, prof we're not, we're professional colleagues, but we don't work in the same <laughs> institution. Um, but it's, so the full title is Radical A, Alternative Film and Video in the San Francisco Bay Area, 1945 to 2000. But it is, it is a, a testament to the collaborative and entrepreneurial and experimental spirit of all of these extraordinary people <laughs> who have a profound love of, of film, of, um, not just film but also like video and alternative uh, alternative ways of seeing and understanding and being in the world um that is professed through artwork but also manifested through these through the the, the building of community around film and doing image art so it's a it's a collection of essays and other small things so you can definitely it's, you can take it in bite bite sizes and I don't necessarily re recommend you read it front to back but you know pick it up and see what you you know uh, just like pick things up at random see this is great I'm gonna read this later <laughs> I read this one queer film in the 70s a personal odyssey by Michael Wallen there you go <laughs> yeah Michael Wallen great filmmaker former director at Canyon Cinema awesome person there you go <laughs> That is possibly the most passionate book recommendation we've had as part of the series in, in a, a video series about film. <laughs> There's so many bookmarks in here. It's so ridiculous. And it's like, wait, why is this bookmark here? And then some of this is actually my 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 husband's copy. And so there's like my bookmarks and his bookmarks. And this is a lot of it's a lot of love for that book <laughs> in this house. <laughs> 
Uh, and Tanav, thank you again so much for taking the time to be with us and for everyone out there watching. Uh, please go to the BAM PFA website, link down at the bottom here, and check out this uh, online exhibition, which is only going to be up for a couple of weeks. So make sure to uh, hurry up and get in there. It's really some fascinating stuff. I forgot to talk about that on March, Sunday, March 14th, there's a live stream with ah. the book's author and uh, Carrie Lydala, a extraordinary Bay Area, a contemporary Bay Area filmmaker who's um, going to be doing some reading from uh, Arledge's memoirs. So it's going to be, so it's March 14th at 5 p.m. Pacific, and all the details are on the Van PFA website. That's fantastic. See, that was important. It's a good thing you said. Sorry, yeah. I, mentioned it earlier. <laughs> I have it in my notes. <laughs> All right, Antonella, it was wonderful seeing you again. I'm hoping that we can be in the same physical space again at some point in time. Uh, we'll go to a Dodgers game. Yeah. <laughs> All right, take it easy.